Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast broadcast of This Week in Science, where we come together every week on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. ish Pacific time to discuss all the science news that we decide is important to discuss this week. And we chat about it. We have a lot of fun. This is the pre-show getting started, letting you know that if you're here, you're watching the uncut magic. This is how the... Why bacon? Why is it how the bacon is made? I it, I don't know. It's how the, the sausage is made. Keith. The sausage, regardless, still similar, similar. Like the, it's the process. Editing it's the will thing happen. that when you find out about, <laughs> then you don't want to eat no. the thing because you're oh. like, oh, oh, that's how they make it. This is more like so, how the cookies so are made. You, like it's a true cookie experience. Show, you like cookies and don't you want to this version of it. And you you want to sample the cookie like, dough. Oh, it's just them talking. Cookie dough. Raw cookie dough. It's okay. Really, no. Uh, I mean, the eggs iffy. Whatever. But yeah, like, whatever. it's the flour more than the eggs, actually. Yeah. So, oh, I Last know. of Us. I know. Anyway, um, Wait, we're going to start up. the show, <laughs> and the podcast version will be edited. So just keep that in <laughs> mind as we get going. Hit those likes. Hit those subscribes. Hit all the buttony buttons that are not really buttons, but just little. Um, icons on your screen. That's what we want you to do right now because we're going to start the show. Starting the show in a three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 914, recorded on Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. Welcome to the Science Carnival. Hey, everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with work, eggs, and surgery. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. History has a lot of lessons for us modern humans. For one, we are only the current modern humans. There were other current modern humans in the past. At times, several versions of then current modern humans existed simultaneously. In the future, there will likely be different current modern humans than the current modern humans of today. I do hope they remember us well. We are, in a sense, just a placeholder for humanity, a pin in the ever-flowing corkboard of time, a post-it note on the ever-expanding desktop of eternity, a truck stop along the always receding highway of evolution. But as the currently most current, current modern humans, we have the most to benefit by looking into the past, because there is more of it. Sometimes that just means there's more of human history to pour over in ancient writings, artifacts, and fossil finds, but it also means that there is more modern history to discover. Recent advancements and discoveries in science from the most productive period in scientific history, the history we like to think of as This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening And Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about science because that's what we like to do. Kiki, so, you're back. And I, I didn't destroy the show. <laughs> of course, you didn't destroy the show. Thank you for covering. Thank you for keeping it going. My pleasure. <laughs> of course, you did an amazing job. Jeez. I didn't explode anything. It was great. No. I, <laughs> I expected everything to be totally fine, and it absolutely was. Good. Okay, so I'm leaving now, and you all get to do the show without no. me. No. Just, just keep going. It's fine. It's fine. No, please keep doing the things. <laughs> all right. 
I'll keep doing the things like telling you that we have a whole bunch of science lined up for you today. I have a story about the innermost core, the core in the core, the core, core, core. Um, also some j discoveries, sharkless vaccines, and heart prints, like fingerprints, but not really, really, not really, and brain, brain repair. What do you have, Justin? I've got a four-day work week. Is it worth it? Yes. Another reason Da Vinci was an amazing guy. Volunteering for cranial surgery in medieval Italy. And why if you're a why if you're a student, you should actually be sleeping late. It's it's actually oh, this better, again. better for your education right. and your, your future outcomes. And, and and we'll talk more specifically about this, but it's not we're not talking about kindergartners. So you, this is universal though, because it, yeah, you're right. Most yeah, of these talking. studies in the past are like, whoa, what do the young children think about the young, you? The young. Are, are you saying you're trying to bring child development science into how we run schools? Mm. Interesting. Hmm. What well, an we interesting certainly, idea. Can't wait. <laughs> certainly are not including that in our program, which, if you would like to subscribe to it, is found on pretty much every podcast platform that is out there, the ones that you know and love. And if you look for This Week in Science, you should be able to find us. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and Mastodon as at Twist Science. And we broadcast live on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time for all of you who are out there. But if this is just a lot of information, go to our website, twist.org, and you can find a bunch of things there, like show notes and links and all these ways to subscribe. So on with the science. Wait, I brought stories. Oh, good gracious. <laughs> I could go, I guess. <laughs> Um, and, hey Blair, yeah, what'd you bring? Yeah. Oh, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Maybe you can edit this and put one piece where the other piece should be, and then this is I'm, this is going to be me saying. And Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, I brought David Attenborough, and I also brought um, old ladies, and these are old ladies of the monkey and naked mole rat variety. So. All right. We have yeah. some interesting company tonight in the Animal Corner. For sure. Company, company. But now, let's dive into the science, yeah? Yes. yes. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Everybody likes doing their core strength workouts, right? And if you're, if you're into being strong, having a nice strong spine, you're like, oh, I'm going to work out the core muscles and then there, they, people talk about the the corset oh please let muscles. this be a study that says you don't need to do that anymore <laughs> no actually it is uh I'm, I'm throwing everyone completely off course because this is a story about the earth's core oh oh well just like with our core if you get a six pack, it's like, oh, look at those cute muscles on the the top of the, the top of the abdomen that have no fat on them. That oh, there are muscles underneath those muscles, the girdle. There's muscles under muscles, and so researchers have determined by uh, once again listening to bouncing earthquakes through the earth, seismic reverberations, they have determined that not only not only is there a crust a mantle, an outer core, an inner core. There is a fifth level, the innermost inner core. Oh, The innerest core. The innerest. The most <laughs> interesting. I hope that sticks. <laughs> and so this is the core. This is the core that is solid. Super solid, iron, sulfates, it's, it's rock, it's, they don't think it, there's any liquidity to it, that it, this is the part that's really crystallized, but yeah, instead of four layers to our earth, now researchers 
have said there are five. It gets more complicated and nuanced the longer that we look at it. The mm -hmm. innermost inner core, everyone. It's cores all the way down, <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> It really is. Um, this is published in Nature Communications this week, and researchers are calling it something of a uh, metallic ball, a solid metallic ball. And they have used a number of earthquakes, one particularly an earthquake in Alaska that caused seismic waves to penetrate all the way through the core, bounce off the other side of the crust of the earth, and then come all the way back through that enabled them to really be able to get this information. The re researchers say this inner core is like a time capsule of Earth's evolutionary history. It's a fossilized record that serves as a ga gateway into the events of our planet's past, events that happened on Earth hundreds of millions to billions of years ago. Um, you know, that said, we're still not going to be going there anytime soon. So a lot of this is, you know, still speculation because we're dealing with the ringing bell of the earth and it's um yeah mm -hmm. reverberations and basically sonar through our planet but yeah they analyzed about 200 magnitude six and above earthquakes from the last decade to get this information so do we have to worry about the innermost core stopping or changing directions now <laughs> I, I, this is not a question that I am able to answer. Yeah, it's. I mean, the thing is, I think we, we have, have enough to worry about it. up here. Yeah, we may have just discovered it, but it's always been there. So I think it's fine. It's always been there. The core is the core. It's still the core. It's it's the coriest core. All right, we'll move on. That's all I really wanted to start with. How about let's work less? Can you can you help us with that, Justin? Yes, please, Justin. So, well, so the way you phrase that may, may or may not be please. may or may not be completely accurate. But what what if we had a four day work week? Would yes, it please. really work? Yes. It sounds nice. Who wouldn't want to have that three day weekend every week? It would come with it. Might imagine that even without a study, employee well-being would be positively affected. Yes. At first. Yes. What about a little bit of a long-term consequence there? And and most importantly, how would the businesses suffer? Most Think importantly, of the businesses. Yes. Think of the businesses suffering. Sixty-one organizations in the UK with around twenty-nine hundred employees in total committed to working a four-day four work week. All staff, every level, with, importantly, no fallen wages for a six-month period. Most of them kept their full-time productivity targets. So not less work, just fewer hours at work. So Justin, so this hours? wasn't four tens. Yeah, is it still 40 hours a week or is it just No, four they days? reduced the number of hours. So yes. I worked yes. I worked I tell you I worked four tens for for a number of years. That was the best schedule ever. But four eights would be better. <laughs> four eights would also be very yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. Although at that point it doesn't matter because in that four day work week, honestly. You have all of the energy to do four tens. It's not a problem. Also, I was younger, so that might have been something to do. Anyway. Well, yeah, that's the other thing, too, is is uh, four tens are very much like a, a young person's game that doesn't have children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If no, you're gone for 10 hours plus commute, you you can't really see young children at all. Yeah. That's your that's your day. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, cr I mean, sorry to derail, Justin, but um, I have a 980 schedule which is amazing. So I work nine hour days, five days. Uh, well, I guess I work nine hour days, four days. Then I get a three day weekend. Then I work nine hour days, four days. And then I work an eight hour day. So I get, I get a three day weekend every other week, which is great. But yeah. now I'm looking at having a family soon and I'm going to have to drop it because it does make a sacrifice to your home time. So like I'm very intrigued in this because I assumed the story was about four tens. 
No, yeah, they just yeah. did. Uh, they just did reduction in hours down to I guess the uh, thirty-two. Okay. So, the question though is, how did it go? Because before we get too excited about trying it, it was great for the employees. Yes, sixty-one organizations, twenty-nine hundred employees tried it out for six months. How did it go? Absolutely fabulously. 71% yes. of the employees reported low, lower levels of burnout. 39% stated they were less stressed. 60% of employees found an increased ability to combine paid work with care responsibilities. I think that's what you're talking about there, Blair. 62%, this is the younger folks maybe, reported an e easier to combine work with their social life. For some parents of young children, a midweek day off meant saving on childcare expenses, while those with older children got more me time. Yes. 65% reduction. This is probably the most interesting one. 65% reduction in sick days. Mm. Wow. Because you can schedule your doctor's appointments on your day off. Or, or, you know, just power through it for that one more day. Yeah, or not have burnout. <laughs> yeah. 57% less employee turnover, which is a big percentage, but it's, I, I don't know how many, how, what the number uh, of people being turned over. So it might've only been a few uh, to begin with from the previous six month, uh, not the previous, the previous years, same six month period. Uh, but yeah, I'm surprised they had any, cause I don't see how you quit a four day work week, no. even for a better job. If it means going no. back to five days, right? <laughs> like, yeah, there's a better opportunity over there, more money and everything else. But yeah, they want, they want, they want more hours for that. That's no good. Some companies stopped work completely for the three day weekend, while others staggered their staff uh, to create a reduced workforce over the period of the week. Company revenues barely changed. They increased by 1.4% on average over the six month period, which I guess depending on what the projections are uh, for a company, it might be great, it might be terrible. I don't know that one, but uh, it must've been okay because 56 out of the 61 companies that participated say they intend to continue with the four day work week. Research for the UK trials was conducted by a team of social scientists from the University of Cambridge, working with academics from Boston College in the US and a think tank called Autonomy. Companies involved ranged from everything from online retailers and financial service providers to an animation studio, a local fish and chip shop. There was a consultancy company that apparently really, really liked the, this uh, participating. Housing, IT, skincare, uh, hospitality, marketing, healthcare, a broad grouping of companies. The only ones that had sort of any complaint, I guess, uh, was, uh, I don't know if it was the animation studio, but uh, what was described as a, a, the people who had more creative jobs uh, enjoyed taking more downtime at work. Mm. Uh, it, it was sort of like they, you know, that helped the the process of creativity. Right. And to get into so, that flow state or to have that. Yeah. And so for them, yeah. they were like kind of like, like probably not like complaining loudly because they got the three day weekend. But we're saying like the condensed amount of work that they needed to put out uh, was t was uh, was not as as favorable. They didn't like that. They like being able to take a three hour lunch and think about something. Huh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the one aspect of the work culture is just how much work is expected by particular deadlines. And so if you are going to that four day work week, are people still able to get the same amount of work done? Are they um, or like you were mentioning with the creatives, are they more likely to have it feel more stressful because they feel like they don't have the same time for that creative process that they need? Yeah. So perhaps this is the kind of thing that could be. Uh, flexible, depending on the career or the person. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I, I think part of part of what's going on here too is with that three day work week. It seems like there's, there's reported less stress, less burnout, 
more time for social engagement, whatever. People are coming back without a Monday. Because regardless if you start, you ended the work, nobody comes in on Friday or nobody comes in on Wednesday or whatever. It basically eliminates the Monday where you're coming back and you're dragging yourself to work to start this whole week thing over again. It, it, I get the sense that, that it's they're just jumping in. And then the Friday where everybody's checking out by noon, everybody works through their, their Friday and doesn't have a Monday. I don't know. I, I push back on that one. I think Monday exists no matter what. Because think about like your first <laughs> day back from a vacation is uh, tough. Always. Yeah. But what I will say is some of, I don't know if this is for everybody, but some of my most productive time is the afternoon before my weekend. Because I have stuff I want to get done before I leave. Right. And that doesn't matter what day of the week it is. If I'm about to leave on a vacation or if I have an appointment the next day, or if I have my three day weekend, I'm trying to You're get pushing. stuff done before I go home. Yep. And so it's, this is, this is the way work week should be moving. Our technology is improving. We can work faster and more cohesively. We should be able to work less instead of do more in the same amount of time. The only, the, the only direction word things of, should be going. The only yeah. word of warning I would uh, throw out in relation to this story, because I love a four-day work week. I think it's brilliant. I think it absolutely should happen. This was a participation by companies that agreed not to reduce yeah. salaries. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So other companies also have been contacting uh, these companies, being like, oh, hey, how'd it go? Tell us more, tell us more, tell us more, because they're probably thinking, hey, if I can get the same productivity and pay mm -hmm. every employee eight hours a week less. Yeah. Uh, and that also, see, that's that's the other, it's sort of like how automation sounds like it's going to make your life easier. And then it turns out it just means you can't get a job in your industry anymore. Or that it means that you how it works. do more because it makes everything more efficient. Yeah. It just yeah. depends on, on where that efficiency is taking place. If it, if it's what used to be your job, it's terrible. So. But if your if your goal is to stimulate the economy, giving people more free time just gives them more time to spend money on things. Thank oh, you. Yes, look at um, that. Thank you. If you're if you're a service facing business, and now you have a three day weekend of of people going out to restaurants and bars and getting their their hair done and going shopping or whatever it is people do on these weekends, yes. Then then you it's have dangerous. another. Prime Whatever day humans of, of do business. Whatever those humans are doing out there. You have another prime <laughs> opportunity for your earnings that should go up. And since we're a service oriented company or countries anyway, like we've gone away from a lot of manufacturing stuff. It requires like people going somewhere and doing stuff within the, the community. And yeah, give them an extra day off so you can boost that local economy. Absolutely. If only this would actually happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, who knows? Perhaps this kind of data will push things in different directions. There is a lot of flux going on right now in a lot of areas related to employment. And it's important that studies like this happen so that there is data behind decisions that are being made. I don't, I don't want to be nasty, but the last thing I want to say is like, the pandemic showed us how effective and beneficial teleworking is. There yeah. are heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of data on how effective that is. But if you look on the whole, companies are pushing to bring people back to the office right now. Yep. And so I would love to think this is going to do something. I'm really hoping, I'm really like clenching both fists and hoping that, that this will go somewhere. But I can't help but see what happened with teleworking and go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I try to be. I try to be an optimist. I, <laughs> I try not to get jaded, even though there's a lot to be jaded about. But let's talk about the like, goodness in the world, oh. Blair. Oh my goodness, oh, you have such goodness. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, hey, do you watch nature documentaries? Either yes. of you? Oh, yes. yes. They're good, scientifically speaking. <laughs> Oh, not just based on the producers and the... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, watching nature, nature documentaries makes people more interested in plants. 
potentially provoking involvement in botany and ecology. So there have oh. been studies on um, things like Blue Planet, Planet Earth, all these other um, kind of documentaries in the past and how it ha changes our behavior, what we're Googling for, what we're donating to, and it has an impact. So in particular, researchers wanted to look at what it does to plant species because about 40% of plant species that we've identified are under threat of extinction. But there is a cognitive bias in humans called plant blindness or plant awareness disparity, which it's basically just walking around and seeing something green with leaves and going, yeah, that's a plant. <laughs> yeah. And so while, while we're generally concerned with the danger to animal species, threats to plants are harder to recognize and address, especially since, yeah, that's a plant. Um, plants receive less than 4% of federal funding for endangered species, despite being about 57% of the endangered species list. Wow. So knowing that, they focused on the 2022 BBC documentary narrated by Sir David Attenborough, of course, Green Planet, to look whether this documentary promoted plant awareness, which could ultimately increase audience engagement with plant conservation programs. It was watched by about 5 million people in the UK. I'm sure it's also on streaming devices and, and has been seen by many more people than that. But specifically, the study was looking in the UK um, and this, the documentary featured a diversity of plant species, looking at vegetation from tropical rainforests, aquatic environments, seasonal lands, deserts, and urban spaces. And it, the program also talked about environmental concerns directly, talking about monoculture, deforestation, and other threats to plants. So then they explored people's online behavior around the time of the broadcast. They noticed the species that appeared on the show. Uh, they looked at the time they appeared on the screen. And then they extracted Google Trends and Wikipedia hits for the same species before and after the episodes aired. And so 28.1% of search terms representing plants from the documentary had peak popularity the week after the broadcast of the relevant episode. Almost a third of Wikipedia pages related to plants mentioned in Green Planet showed increases, increased visits the week after the broadcast as well. So Google and Wikipedia showed that people were looking these things up. So it at least was increasing awareness and interest in these plant species. So in this study, they indicate that nature documentaries can, in fact, increase plant awareness among audiences and suggest that viewers found certain plant species particularly captivating. So um, much like there are certain uh, poster species for endangered species, as we talk about sometimes, they can actually use this information to leverage specific plant stories and plant species to raise money for plant conservation. Hmm. So uh, they can use this kind of for a next step as well. But in the end, those documentaries are doing good. They are adding awareness to people who might not have it in other ways, even for plants, not just animals. More plant documentaries. Yeah. That's what we That's need. pretty interesting. I, I would also encourage people, especially if you've got a, a garden outdoors, but even, even indoors, go find out what your local native plant species are and, and plant those. You know, yeah, there's, I'm, there's, I'm very excited a... about getting rid of the invasive English ivy that is around my house and trying to plant native berry plants and native yeah. ferns and all sorts of uh, native plants this spring as we start heading in. Yeah, and yes. if this is if this is something that's kind of interesting to you, you don't just have to watch Green Planet over and over. You could actually go to um, to natural history museums and learn about plants there. But also, if you want to learn about the specific plants that are where you live, uh, you can often find guided hikes in parks near you. You can um, find nature programs at museums or gardens or sometimes even at the kind of um, at plant stores, right? Sometimes they'll have at a nursery, they'll have actually uh, educational programs there. So there's lots of opportunities for you to hear compelling stories about plants and learn more about them. Not to mention the the app Seek. I feel like I just discovered that kind of recently and it's been so fun to just be like, that's what that's called. That's what that's called. So there's there's lots of new opportunities to learn about plants around you. I learned uh, I learned from uh, a study that was uh, that was put out or not put out by, but shared by 
a local California wildflower uh, organization that was pointing out that uh, California native wildflowers are more fire resistant than invasive, which at the time I read that was before all of the wildfires. And then when the yeah. wildfires happen, I'm like, oh gosh, I wonder. <laughs> you no need wonder. to throw you so, need to throw more of those wild the, the wildflower well, seeds around, Justin. I mean, you've told yeah. us before on the show oh, how you yeah, love yeah. to throw the seeds. Pockets seed. full of, pockets the of wild poppy flowers. seeds and other <laughs> native wildflowers. I was I was planting them in, in empty fields or wherever I but yeah, don't do that they, where they, you are now though. Then then it's an no, invasive no, 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 species. They, don't well, do that. I'd have to find whatever the, the, yeah. the native species is here to make it make it work. But the the thing that it told too is it tells you that California is a place that has a lot of fires. Likely that's why the native wildflowers are more <laughs> fire resistant yeah. than flowers in places that don't burn as often. So it also tells you something about the history of California just by studying the native plant. That's a oh, good absolutely. point. Yeah. Other places we like to study are in outer space. We like to look at outer space. And Hubble gave us many views of distant galaxies, gave us ideas that there were big galaxies starting some 300, 400, 500, 600, 700 million years after the Big Bang, very close to the Big Bang. But now with the JWIST from NASA, the telescope has given us a view, thanks to a particular study called the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey, where they've looked into a patch of space near the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is probably very familiar for many of us. You look into the sky and, oh, look, there's the Big Dipper. Or uh, as others like to call it, it's Ursus Majoris, or Ursus, it's the, it's the big bear too, right? And so they looked into this area of space where Hubble has looked before, and it wasn't very interesting. However, with this new resolution that they have, they have looked at some fuzzy spots. They went, whoa, what are those fuzzy spots? And oh, those fuzzy spots appear very red oh, what are these red fuzzy spots? And in astronomy, red light usually means distance and the slowing down of light. And uh, usually it's uh, light that's traveled a very, very, very long way to get to us. And the researchers that have just published their study in Nature have determined that they've found a bunch of galaxies that are pretty big, like Milky Way kind of size. And they existed about 500 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. And this is one of those discoveries that if you're in the astronomy community, having the data for it, people are going to say, this is going to rewrite textbooks. Um, but yes, they shouldn't have had the time to form. They shouldn't have been so big. They shouldn't have all the stars in them that they have. And because we have a device that's in space now that has clearer imaging and can look further back and get through dust and be able to really see that infrared spectrum, they're able to determ determine uh, these possibilities that there, there are these big things way back when. So, so is that... Is that uh, when they shouldn't be there because it's too soon in the early universe? Does that just mean yeah. that the early universe was earlier than we think it was? Right. That things may that, have coalesced that number's a lot. been pushed back a few times. It has been. And uh, with Hubble, and there are lots of, oh, there are galaxies that have been found earlier than we expected. And so this is not mm -hmm. the first time that this kind of discovery has been made. It is specifically the first time that the size of the objects has been so large this far back or this early in our universe's history. Yeah. So if that yeah. if we keep our current model of how how things formed in the early universe, that means the universe may be older than we think. That's a really that's an interesting question too. And somebody uh, Harjar in the YouTube chat says it's moving away from us. So we also have to consider uh, the 
expansion of the universe, but I'm sure they've taken that into account as well. But it's, it, it is a very tantalizing question of did things start earlier than we think, or do processes at the early stages of the universe, are they different than the way we think they are currently? And so these are these are the questions that we cannot answer, but we're seeing fuzzy dots that make a, make our scientists ask questions. I like fuzzy dots. Fuzzy dots. Do they make you ask questions? I don't know. Um, what other science do we have here? Oh, oh speaking of fuzzy old. dots. Yeah, fuzzy dots. What do you have, Justin? Well, if you think of the world's most famous painter. A uh, number of prominent painters might come to mind. If you were to instead consider a prolific inventor in history, a different set of names might come up. If we conjure the important designers, anatomists, or engineers of history, still more names we could try to choose from. But if you were asked to consider a famous painter, inventor, designer, anatomist, and engineer all at once, the only name that should appear is Leonardo da Vinci. Amazing guy. Would have been pretty cool to hang out with, have a cup of coffee, you know. I, I think so. I think so. I would have just loved to watch him write backwards. That would that would with his mirrors. Cool by itself. Yeah. So uh, now engineers at Caltech are suggesting that we add physicist to the list of things that Leonardo da Vinci was pretty awesome at sure an article published <laughs> in the journal leonardo researchers found that one of da vinci's notebooks illustrated an experiment that you know this illustration is in uh this book that's got all these you know thousands of pages and they this is what you see when you see pictures of leonardo da vinci's drawings and stuff it's usually taken from this this uh, book of papers that he, this notebook of his that he wrote down. The notebook itself covers like 40 years of his work. And there was this sort of interesting diagram with a few words, a little bit of math attached to it that yeah, it just was interesting, but nobody really deciphered it or thought about it too, too much. Researchers found that it is actually illustrating an experiment meant to demonstrate that gravity is a form of acceleration. This is, this is about 100 years before Galileo theorized it, 150 before Newton developed a mathematical law to explain why apples kept dropping on his head. Da Vinci had proved or provided experimental evidence and modeled the gravitational constant with around 97% accuracy. He could have done better. Researchers think <laughs> that a lack of a good stopwatch prevented him from more precisely measuring time it took for objects to fall. Uh, da Vinci mathematically described the acceleration as the falling object's distance being proportional to two to the time power instead of proportional to time squared. Oh, I got to carry the, the square over to that. Anyway, however, so they're kind of like, oh, he just kind of got the math a little, it wasn't quite there mathematically. However, they then realized that in, in, in recreating his experiment, the Da Vinci's illustration of a falling object was for up to four intervals of time, which is a period in which the graph of the wrong equation that he used and the right equation actually matched up. So he found, he found, the way to run his experiment so that everything everything worked. The page uh, is found in the Codex Arundel, the collection of papers written by Da Vinci covering a 40 year span from 40 year span from 1478 to 1518. It, one of the things that had caught the researchers' eyes who ended up figuring out what it was was notated on the page equitione de morte, meaning equivalence of motions. The paper is titled Leonardo da Vinci's visualization of gravity as a form of acceleration. There's going to be a link to it on our website. So I want to talk about the fact that um, 
we're still discovering things that Leonardo knew. And yeah. so much so yeah. that there is a whole journal called Leonardo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is blowing me that away. That featured like, a story about Leonardo that was yeah. There is enough there is a, a a a rich enough spring of information that we have not yet discovered when it comes to Da Vinci's texts that there's a journal for it. Like I just yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I wow it's very cool and it's crazy that we didn't know this until now and it turns out he's he was he was living on another level next we're gonna find out so, he was he was a prima ballerina in his spare time you know <laughs> he, was, he was also he was also all the poly. he was poly uh like polymath, polymath? What they call it. yeah polymath yeah. okay is, uh, I thought you were saying something else <laughs> no polymath yeah so, so <laughs> Like he's that's considered not really relevant, I think, but I guess that's interesting. <laughs> he's considered the well, who knows? He was considered the uh, the idealization or the 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 uh, the the eminent pre the the Renaissance man. I mean, you know, painted the Mona Lisa. You invented the uh, tanks and flying machines and uh, detailed anatomy that hadn't been detailed or drawn or described before. He did all these things to the point where if we had just found out that somebody you know, in the 14, 1500s had, had discovered laws of gravity hundred years before Galileo, we'd be like, oh, who is this? This is amazing. And then you find out it's Leonardo da Vinci and you're like, oh yeah, oh, yeah that, that makes sense. Of course, <laughs> of, course he, of course he understood how gravity works. Leonardo da Vinci, there's nothing he can't do. Yeah, who else? <laughs> I think the fascinating aspect of this is that it's just a matter of everybody going back and dig digging into all the notes and all the things yes. that are there, right? And taking the time to really investigate it. And yeah, he was ahead of his time, but and it I is don't know that if you have the. I don't know if you played the the little video. That I was did. In there. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, did, I, was, yes. oh, I didn't have my screen up. But yeah, how 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 closely like the physical experiment that he had yeah. created, and the actual how physical tracked. experiment that we can recreate yeah. today track is yeah. just uh yeah but again yeah but it, leonardo da vinci not yeah. anybody, if it was anybody else we'd be like who is this person oh we gotta vault their name up with the others because now we have a first father of gravity and blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. leonardo well, <laughs> it's all good he was a good dude came up with lots of neat ideas <sighs> we just didn't write them all down at the right time or he didn't. Um, a couple quick stories to wind up this first part of our show. Uh, squalene. Do you know what it is? It's shark oil. Oh, yes, Blair. It is. Never have guessed, <laughs> Never have guessed it. Squalene? It has to do with their buoyancy, I think. Yeah, it is shark liver oil specifically. It comes from their livers, and it is one of the main reasons that we still hunt sharks, that we fish for sharks, is that we use squalene as an adjuvant for vaccines. And there are synthetic versions, but they don't work as well a lot of the time. Um, and we're trying to make more synthetic versions of squalene. And in a public uh, study published this last week in NPJ vaccines, researchers have synthesized and tested 20 new squalene-like compounds. Uh, and they tested them in a dish with mouth cells and then human cells. And then they also tested them in real mice. We haven't put them in people yet. Um, but they determined that Depending on the number of carbon atoms, apparently squalene itself has 30 carbon atoms. Uh, there's a particular uh, compound which scientists have access to that's beta farnesine, and it has only uh, 15 carbon atoms. But because of the beta far farnesine, they're able to work off of that and build new structures and different structures, and they've been testing them and they found some that actually did better than squalene itself, others that did worse. They tested against the H5N1 flu in mice. 
And they found after two immuniza immunizations, the mice were able to make antibodies against H5N1, uh, which is bird flu. Yes, not a nice flu that we're all worried about right now. And hopefully, sooner rather than later, we'll be able to stop hunting sharks for their liver oil nice. and be able to synthesize these compounds in a lab and have more effective vaccines than we currently do. That's great. Yes, we're getting there. And then also as a researcher uh, who's involved in this general area of science told the scientist, he said that these kinds of trials also help us understand how adjuvants actually work, mm -hmm. like the mechanisms of the adjuvants at play that help to accentuate the impact of the viral particles that you're hmm. giving, you know, these little, little tiny antigens that we deliver in our vaccines. Why do antigen, why do, uh, why do adjuvants work? Why do we need them? Why does our immune system like that double, double, triple hit at the same time? I assumed, I would have assumed that would have already been worked out. Yeah, I, me that, too. But that's, but that's like, that is. <laughs> but, but we that still is use like, eggs to make vaccines too. Right, big so. hammers. <laughs> it, it, oh, big tool. Oh, it works. Yeah. There we go. Well, but we don't really know all the little details. Yeah, there's a lot of that, that people assume we know why we do things. And, yeah. and the reason that we do things is because it works. Uh, speaking of things that works, this may be the uh, part of the show that um, we should probably edit from the radio version. I don't know, but uh, YouTube's probably not going to like it because researchers have been um, looking at an object that they found in a place called Vindolanda. This wooden object could have been a good luck symbol, could have been a charm, could have been some religious object, something like that. But, um, wait, wait, wait like, wait, this is when the uh, anthropologists, archaeologists are like, oh, it was uh, used for rituals, a ritual, uh, device. right, uh, right. Yeah. So, this, so this spirit had a spiritual connection. Yes. Uh, to the people. Yeah, so it's a, a wooden a wooden tool, a wooden object. I won't say a tool. We don't know whether it was a tool, but these researchers at Newcastle University and University College Dublin, um, they found it with a bunch of other tools and craft waste products, leather bits and bits of antler that had been carved and other things. It was a, it was a piece of something in a ditch. All right. And now the researchers have determined that it very likely w was not a tool. And they have published a discussion paper in the journal Antiquity about their uh, determination that it very likely was a wooden phallus that was well used. And it could have also been used as a pestle like for a mor mor mortar and pestle for food grinding, grinding ingredients. Maybe it would have imbued the ingredients with magical properties. Uh, Un unlikely that you would need to have crafted it in such a detailed way. Yes. Well, except that, used for, I mean, there's that? lots of cultures that, that use the imagery of a phallus to signify things. So I could see yes. how it wouldn't be a crazy leap to say, well, maybe you made this uh, mortar and pestle situation look a particular way to signify things. I could see that. I could buy it. This makes more sense, though. It's like the, the most obvious answer is usually the correct one. Right. And the, one of the options, another option they discussed in their paper is that it could have been attached to a statue that people, it, it, it might have been worn down because people touched it as a, a good luck uh, action sure. as, they en as they entered a building and maybe it sure. became unstuck from that statue. And, and it's uh, wood, you say? It's made of wood, mm. uh, but they do... <sighs> They do have their primary hypothesis that it was a sexual implement. Right. Both ends Made were well wood. smoothed. Yes. 
I'd want to make sure it was very smooth. <laughs> Not um, have any accidental splinters. Right. If you would like to see this object of ancient times, it is on display now in the Vindolanda Museum, which is in uh, a Roman fort area. Yeah, so you can go take a look at it if you are when in Rome, right? When in Rome. You know, it's it's one of the things that is curious. Like, I would, uh, I'm surprised we haven't found more examples yeah. of this. But maybe we have, and they just weren't yeah. as detailed. Maybe they weren't as detailed, and I do... Maybe people about weren't using of... mortar and pestle nearly as much as we think we were. Uh. <laughs> they were oh, you keep finding all these pestles everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Where are the mortars? Yes. <laughs> the pestles are everywhere. No mortars. Uh, but one thing I think is is interesting about this is that they really are looking at multiple hypotheses, ideas for what it could possibly be, as opposed to just saying religious artifact. Right. It's a good luck charm and just falling back on uh, could the, be both. It could be. It, mm -hmm. it very possible. It, why not both? But it's good to see um, lots of ideas being put forward about things we really don't know a lot about. Except well, for I, I hope, very definite, definite shape. I hope that this doesn't get censored out of any of our feeds just because I feel like it's important to recognize that these tools likely did exist through time and yes. it's normal and sexual health is part of health and it shouldn't be stigmatized to quite the level that it currently is. So totally agree. It's if you can recognize that this is something that that is ancient as old as us if not older in fact if you look in the animal kingdom guaranteed older so it's <laughs> yeah it's oh, worth of course, recognizing a lot it's of our, not it's not such a forbidden thing a lot of our stigma comes from uh puritan roots? more <laughs> more recent history than yeah. uh than the yeah. romans so yeah the for certain yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us for This Week in Science. If you are enjoying the show right now, please head over to twist.org and click on our Patreon link. Patreon is how we support the show. And with your support, we can keep doing it week after week, bringing you more science, more curiosity, lots of discussion, $10 and more per month. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. And we have a sticker pack now that is uh, available. I think it's for the $15 and up a month level of patrons where every three months you'll get a, a new sticker from Twist. They're Blair's art mostly. But <gasps> really? Yes. Can I have a sticker pack? I will try. Yes. <laughs> <I'll get you. laughs> we'll do what we can. Okay. We thank you for all of your support. We cannot do this without you. And now back to more This Week in Science. It is time for that wonderful part of the show that is, I guess, this week full of old ladies. Yes. It is Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. About animals, she's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a boat boat. Oh my goodness, I want to talk about naked mole rats. Mm, I'm so okay. excited. Naked mole rats, they're a wonder. We talk about them all the time. They survive cancer, they can't get cancer, they don't mind radiation. They don't age the same way that other animals their size age. They don't feel pain. There's so much crazy stuff with them. Add to the list. Eternal fertility. Eternal. Yes. Oh, it's, I'm so it's, sorry. You know, for their entire lifespan. Um, What's so their lifespan? It's less like than ours. 30 years. Oh, whoa. Oh, yeah. wow. Which okay. for a mouse is like two years. <laughs> Maybe four if you're a healthy mouse. 
Um, but so for most mammals, as any um, humans with ovaries listening will know, you are told you are born with a fi- finite number of eggs. They are produced in utero via a process called oogenesis. Because of the limited supply, the egg cells deplete over time. Some are released during ovulation, but most of them just get old and die. <laughs> Fertility declines with age. As any, again, human with ovaries in their mid-30s has been told many times. But naked mole rat queens can breed their entire lives. So something is going on. They're eating the royal jelly from the bees. <laughs> That's got to be it. That's got to be it. Yeah. So Miguel Brienno Enriquez, MD, PhD, assistant professor at McGee Women's Research Institute and the University of Pittsburgh's School of Medicine's Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Scientists, says there are three possibilities for how they do this. One, they're born with a lot of eggs, just so many eggs. There's plenty for their whole life. Two, not as many of them die. So they they don't go bad over time like ours do. Or three, miraculously, they somehow continue to create more eggs after they are born. Kind of like how men can create sperm their whole life. So they looked. And do either of you have a guess of what's going on? I have no idea what's going on. Well, it's a trick question because it's all three. Oh, what? Yes. They compared ovaries from naked mole rats and mice across different stages of development. And despite similar sizes, as I said, mice live about four years. Naked mole rats live about 30. They did find that naked mole rats have an exceptionally large number of egg cells compared to mice. They have about 1.5 1.5 million egg cells, which is 95 times more than mice the same age. This is an eight days good old. head start. Yes. So at eight days old, already amazing head start. Also, the death rates of these cells were lower than in mice throughout their lives. But what is most remarkable and potentially most interesting for human medicine is that oogenesis happens postnatally in naked mole rats. They found egg precursor cells actively dividing in three-month-old animals, and these precursors were found in 10-year-old animals as well, suggesting oogenesis continues throughout their lives. This challenges the, the leading dogma that this is how all mammals work. This was about, established about 70 years ago. Female mammals endowed with a finite, finite number of eggs. You get your eggs. That's it. Use them or lose them. <laughs> and then uh, this is a new idea. And of course, this, uh, this could have an impact on human medicine. Now, part of the reason that this might be happening in mole rats and not in other mammals is that they have this very specific structure where there is a queen naked mole rat, and she is the only one that reproduces. Right. But she can die or be displaced. And when that happens, subordinate females compete to take her place and then become reproductively active when they win. Any girl can be, any female naked mole rat can become a queen at any time. And so that means that at any time in their life cycle, bam, they have to be reproductively active. So to learn more about the process, they removed three-year-old females from the colony to prompt reproductive activation compared Mm -hmm. to subordinate females. They found that non-breeding subordinates had egg precursor cells in their ovaries, but the cells started dividing only after they established themselves as queen. Wow. So not only, this is what I love about this study, not only did they figure out potentially what the heck is going on, they have a lead on a mechanism. They have something very specific to look at to figure out how this is working. And of course, go ahead. Well, and just that, that, that biology affected 
by social position. Yes, and exactly. Yep. Construct is such an interesting connection here. Yes. Yep. And so, of course, if we can figure out how they do this, if you can figure out the mechanism and you can manipulate it in an experiment, you might be able to develop new drug targets or techniques that allow human to allow humans to grow new eggs. Now, I know we have a population <laughs> problem, but we also have a situation where humans are trending to have babies later. And as that happens, the opportunity to have babies is being lost if you wait too long. And so this is most likely going to create a very interesting phenomenon for humans on Earth very soon. So this is an interesting thing to consider, recognizing that. I know, again, we have a population problem. Maybe it doesn't really matter. But ultimately, just well, A, for quality of life, for people that want to have kids and can't, this is huge. But also B, um, to recognize that this might actually be a societal problem. And more on that to come in my next story. Okay. This could be a potential solution to that problem. Not to mention, not to mention, over ovarian health influences cancer, heart health, and lifespan. So if you can understand what's going on in the ovary, you can understand oogenesis better, you might be able to also use these indicators to improve ovarian health. And that by improving ovarian health, you're improving female health, you're yeah. it, it, it's holistic in nature. And under understanding the whole cycle, it, it, it could have social repercussions because if we're talking about something like stress from hierarchies, from uh, social situations, re, uh, causing cortisol responses, causing changes in progesterone, estrogen, you know, all sorts of hormones that are present in our bodies, you know, all of it ties together. And maybe it won't just have health of whole health effects for understanding the ovary but also humans yeah across the board I, I, i'll just uh, throw in there too uh having a even slightly higher percentage of the population that has a trust in science or trust in their medical caregiver not a bad population growth that's true not a Absolutely. Need more of that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now speaking of this kind of phenomenon that we're facing where uh, humans are, are overall trending older. There was a study this week on rhesus macaques in Cayo Santiago, which is known as Monkey Island on Puerto Rico. And they wanted to look at the ratio of older to younger females and how that impacted the monkey culture and society. So just kind of as primer, what I was mentioning before is that global human population of over 60s is expected to double by 2050. So there is a worldwide trend happening about the age skew of humans. Okay. So as that happens, will society change? I mean, society changes no matter what, right? But will this particular thing <laughs> impact society? They So they looked at the rhesus macaques to look at uh, how female macaques act in social networks based on age. And the older macaques reduce the size of their social networks. They prioritize existing connections as they age. This is something that we also see in humans. So this is analogous. And so they wanted to look at how this affects the overall cohesion and connection of the groups older monkeys live in. The observed macaque populations at the max had 20% old individuals. So this was not anywhere near the levels that we will see as humans. So they used this as a model and then turned it into a computer model so they could kind of mess with the ratios a little bit more. So <laughs> they... Yeah. We're not affected at the group level with these 20% differences, but the computer simulation showed higher proportions of old macaques would reduce cohesion and connection. For both humans and macaques, 
focusing on close friends and families later in life brings benefits. It's, it's who you can trust. It's, it's who you can go to when you need something. It's also takes less probably energy to deal with people, you know, than new people. Right. And so, um, they, they kind of wanted to see how these effects cascaded. They looked at six monkey groups collected over eight years, representing in total 19 social networks. Older female macaques, as expected, are poor influencers. They have fewer friends. They are less able to transmit knowledge and experience outside of their immediate social circles. So this impacts the individuals, but it also impacts the dissemination of knowledge. And uh, when they tested whether monkey networks with a greater number of older females, which is over 18 in this case, were less cohesive and connected, they didn't find a statistical difference, but they found enough data that they were then able to extrapolate, right? And so they created a computer model that simulated the effect of higher proportions of old macaques and found a decline in network of cohesiveness and connectiveness, connectedness. <laughs> and that had real substantial consequences for network structure. So that affects things like information transmission, cooperation, and also changes the way disease spread. It actually limits the spread of disease, which at first you're like, oh, that's a great thing. But if it impacts um, immunity, that can also have ah. negative impacts, right? And so looking forward, the extrapolation here is that as the human population of over 60s doubles by 2050, that could have far-reaching effects on the structure of our societies, the way we function, the way information is disseminated, all of these things. Yep. I think that is a little bit harder for me, just because the internet exists. <laughs> but I still think it's an, an important area of study because this is a global phenomenon that is coming and there will be consequences. We don't know exactly what they will be yet, which is why you start with a monkey model, right? But it would be great if you could take this information and then extrapolate that into modeling that we do have like current social trends based on age and all these sorts of things. Of course, it's also kind of different because like we have these huge technological advances between generations. And so whereas generations might all be kind of similar in macaques over a short period of time, in just a difference from one generation to another, there can be huge differences in the way we trade information and the way we communicate and what we value in social structures. So humans are in that way, I think a lot more complicated. Um, but, For sure. you know, and I'm usually here the one saying like, oh, we're always saying that, that humans are different from animals, but we're just the same. But this is definitely, when you're talking about global information sharing, information between cultures. We have our own kind of tribalism going for sure, but there, there is a difference in the way that works than when it would work, how it would work with a troop of macaques. But I still think it's an important thing to study. I think it's a really interesting area of study. And I think there's going to be much more of this moving forward because we do kind of have this very interesting phenomenon coming. And it, it is, it is definitely coming. And if we, you know, bury our heads in the sand uh it, we're it, we're gonna be caught unprepared and yeah it's, and it's yeah it i'm not saying more humans are gonna fix the problem mm -mm. but if we had a way to get people who would like to have a family who can't physically have a family to get a family like with this naked mole rat study that might adjust the skew a little bit and change the way things turn out so I think it was an interesting kind of weird coincidence that these two studies popped in front of me this week, yeah. that they kind of, they play into each other in a really weird way where we don't know what's going to happen to us, man. We have no idea. There's lots of balls in the air. There are a lot of things for us to be concerned about. And yeah, it's been interesting over the last couple of years, knowing that there is this uh, skew, especially among Western nations toward aging populations, because fewer people are choosing to have children, where uh, a lot of the news, however, has been talking about these uh, surveys 
of future populations and go, yeah, our populations are growing, but oh, don't worry about it. We're going to hit like 10 billion by 2100 and that's and it's going to be fine or we're going to go up to 10 billion and then we'll start dropping everything's going to be fine don't worry about it you know and i think there's a lot of uh, messaging and hand waving and you know we have to think about where these messages are coming from and yeah no absolutely yeah but this kind no of no telling yeah. what the future holds no telling yeah no telling oh, you know what the future does hold though morning it holds mornings, Justin. Yeah, it does. So this is a this is a, a interesting story. In the way that they they did it. So this is finding that early class times are associated with lower grades and poor attendance in university students. So initially, they had kind of looked at grades for classes early in the morning because that's sort of the thing the, the early class uh, people might not be awake for yeah how are they doing in the that class versus later classes and it turns out the grades in the morning classes not significantly lower than those held later in the day you, you get just as good a grade for that early morning class that you wake up uh, with your cup of coffee halfway through you still do fine what they did find was there was a cumulative effect, a negative effect on the rest of the classes throughout the day, so much so that students with early morning classes got lower GPA scores, lower grades overall than students that did not have them. And if they had multiple morning classes, <laughs> the more morning classes you, you took, the worse that impact was. Hmm. Your whole day's ruined. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes sense. I mean, you know, even if you are an early, if you're an early riser, well, then maybe, you know, you should uh, take less afternoon classes because maybe you're tired by the end and that's where right. the impact is. It's, it, it doesn't get into that here. But w this is uh, published in the journal uh, Nature Human Behavior. They found that uh, this was also the University of uh, National University of Singapore. And what they did was they were able to estimate class attendance for 23,000 students without their uh, participation, just by using Wi Fi connection logs. They could see who was showing up. And it showed that uh, attendance was lowest for the 8 a.m. classes, about 10 percentage points lower than classes with later start times. They also looked at logins to the, the university's you know, sort of online learning course uh, uh, program. They had 17.4 million time stamped logins of almost 40,000 students. And with that data, they could kind of tell when people were interacting with it and they found that students with the early morning classes stopped interacting at about the same time at night but started interacting with it again earlier, earlier yeah. meaning there was uh, possibly less time that they spent sleeping mm -hmm. and then they did a third leg of this they had uh, 181 students participate in a sleep study and they found sure enough they get an hour less sleep at night if they have the 8 a.m. class. Mm -hmm. And they correlated all of this. Number of days a week a student had a morning class was negatively correlated with their grade point average. Amazing. Uh -huh. So based get your on sleep, the, kids. Get your sleep. <laughs> so uh, the, the researchers are suggesting a university should consider avoiding at least having mandatory morning classes you know universities tend to want to have earlier classes and earlier and earlier classes because you are maximizing the use of the classroom and getting the most teaching time and creating the most options for schedule flexibility so students can take the courses that they want to take but if those morning classes mean students are going to perform worse get lower grades, maybe then have, oh, less job prospects when they graduate because they didn't, 
uh, get his get a great. Oh, and then their earnings over their lifetime are impacted, and then they, they have to work more hours, and they put off having kids longer, and then they have to go into. There you go. <laughs> You're just going down this rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't matter it. if they're Good able to up school. tuition because they, they're able to up the student body numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know. Well, they say the universities also point out, they point out the universities, most universities already have the ability to sort of assess how their own attendance is doing by using just the Wi-Fi login portion. They can see, not maybe necessarily track grades that go with it with this way, but they can see how their own attendance is affected just by looking at their their own Wi-Fi connection logs. I'm going to say that it's a great measure. It's one that they can probably very easily use. But you go into class, you get there, you get your Wi-Fi turned on, and then you fall asleep mm-hmm. in the back of class. That's so <laughs> if you're sleeping through class, yeah. So good. Oh yeah, there it was the other thing. The what was it? The the sleep study students. The there was a third of the time they woke up too late to have made it to their morning class on time. That's the problem. But you have an 8 a.m. class. You have to get to the class in time. That's like, <laughs> yeah. How early do you wake up to get over there? Job. But I did, it did make me wonder, like, the thing that they didn't look at in this study, the thing they didn't look at is, how many people are like, I'm a morning person, so I'm taking all morning classes, but then also tagged on an afternoon class that they shouldn't have because they're a morning person and they should have gone home early and gotten to bed early if they're going to get up early. But, but they the really problem wanted is those classes. They didn't they got, they have to take is it. not conducive to early bedtime. No. <laughs> That's no. the other problem is I'm a morning yeah. person, but... I fell asleep in 8 a.m. classes all the time because I was up late because that was the culture of the space I was in. The culture of the space you're in is also very much determined by the fact that you're no longer in the structured environment where people would usually tell you when to go to bed or you need to go to bed because the rest of the household went to bed or whatever it is. Right. And and you had a set. Also, you had it, you know, before you get to university, you usually have a set morning schedule. You get to university. One day your classes start at noon. The next day they start at 8 a.m. The next day they start at noon. And there's nobody telling Super you to stay up. And your peers yeah. are staying up later because they, hey, no, I'm, I'm free of well, parental because, oversight. Well, partially because teen brains want to stay up later and sleep late. So that, that means it, the yeah. second you remove the constraints, your brain's like, I want to be up now. Yeah. <laughs> so now we just have to convince professor brains. Yeah. And, and university administrator brains to do what's in the best interest of the brains that they have decided to nurture as their career yes. and start everything later. Science says, let's do it. But what if they were volunteering, Justin? Oh, gosh, this one. Yeah, so sometime in the uh, 6th to 8th century, woman underwent skull surgery to scrape a hole into her her skull and it was done willingly apparently procedure went well so much so she apparently decided to do it again multinational group of researchers in the UK Spain France Italy and the US have discovered these skull modifications after detailed observations of a Longobard cemetery, Castle Torsino in central Italy. Uh, The Longobards, I don't know if we've talked about them on this show before. This was a a Germanic warrior mercenary at times, barbarians they were called sometimes. They uh, went and they took over parts of Eastern Austria and Hungary and were in charge there. And then they invaded Italy, invaded Rome, failed, tried to get failed. And then Rome fell and they invaded again. And the people were like, actually, uh, you're the only ones who know how to use swords and maintain order. Why don't you come move to our village? Why don't you come to... So the elites of this warrior culture started getting invited 
to occupy territories in Italy to help maintain order. So it's this interesting. And then they integrated like pretty quickly into becoming just Italians. So why is this woman <clears throat> volunteering to have holes in her skull? Yes. Yes. Why? I thought you were going to say, is... and she was dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no. Twice so she survived. volunteered yeah. while yeah. she was dead. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is, this is, uh, this is the thing. It healed. The bones showed signs that this, you know, this scraping away of skull, uh, bone material to make little holes in the top of the skull healed up. So she survived. At least by at least for six months, because that's how they how long it takes to do the minimum uh he healing that they saw. So it was at least six months, could have been a year, could have been two years, could have been many. The, they did some sex and age determination here. That's how they determined this is a female skull around age 50. So for the analysis. Fairly long lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, uh, although there's there's some, when we talk mortality in oldie times, there's some uh, data uh, miscalculation that's common in that we, we tend to count infant mortalities and youth mortalities that don't happen as often today in the mortality in the average ages of ancient peoples there's nothing that pre really prevented people of of oldie times from from becoming uh, old except unless they got an infection and didn't have antibiotics and then died yeah. but this is the other thing there's no antibiotics this is open skull surgery right yep medieval medieval italy no antibiotics no, I don't even know what they could use for an, uh, you know, painkillers and anesthesia. Very strong whiskey. Yeah, exactly what I was. <laughs> grappa. Say. I'm getting yeah. it's Italy, so grappa, right? Yeah. <laughs> so scanning electron mi microscopy, they did. Uh, they did some ca uh, what do you call it? latex casts, and then made resin casts, and then put that in the CT scan to better look at the second site, and they found. Bone scraping traces on a second location that must have taken place right around the time of death because they didn't heal. So second round of modif uh, skull modification did not go as well as the first. The gravesite of this woman uh, is in a central location in the cemetery of elites. There are wealthy grave goods, gold bronze brooches and combs. So this was this was a wealthy woman of some status within the community. So it's, taking that into consideration, they don't think this was a form of punishment or an unwanted procedure, but rather a voluntary attempt to receive some sort of a therapeutic outcome. So the exact reason for the surgery is difficult to discern. Plenty of reasons why. A woman of medieval means might desire <clears throat> to have a hole in her skull, but none of them were forensically obvious. So it's terrapination is trepanation. the act Something of... with turtles? No, trepanation. No, uh, trepanation. Trepanation. Thank you. Trepanation. trepanation. I was like, what do turtles have to do with this? <laughs> trepanation is the act of scraping holes into a human skull. It was practiced at times in the medieval days. There are actually an amazing number of examples of this. I kind of went looking into it. There's areas uh, in the, in uh, around this medieval time and much later where you can see communities that have 10, 15, 20% of the skulls that we find have evidence that holes were made into the skulls. This was apparently a pretty common procedure. There's some Greek and Roman texts that document it as a medical procedure. What's interesting, though, is there's no examples of it being used to l relieve pressure from a head wound. That's what I would have thought, that maybe there was, yeah. she was having headaches and needed uh -huh. to relieve, they, they yeah. decided there was swelling in the brain or... So that could be, so that could be, it could be headaches, 
right? Yeah. Because evil, that wouldn't show. Evil spirits. They had to re she was having Could seizures mental, and they had illness, to release, evil, release spirit. evil spirits. I don't know. There's what sort of I thought was interesting uh, in this, in the side look at this is one of the highest levels they've seen of this is areas of Hungary, hmm. where they have like really high percentage of the skulls that they find have this terrapination in medieval, but even more so, uh, you know, hundreds of years after. Uh, and they're calling it ceremonial. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. it seems to have been uh, maybe a status thing, maybe a cultural thing. They don't necessarily see how it could have been that high of percentage of the population all getting migraines or having evil spirits or something of this nature. And then, so, so then like I immediately go, ears pierced. <laughs> yeah. So then I immediately think, oh, well, the Longobards, they occupied Hungary for a while. Maybe this is a cultural holdover from some Interesting. members yeah. of the group. The researchers have ruled this out in saying that <laughs> everything about the folks buried here in this community are fully integrated into the Byzantine culture, uh, Italian culture. They don't see cultural holdovers uh, anywhere else. Interestingly, also though, out of the hundred and something uh, uh, remains that they have unearthed, there's only, I think, 19 skulls. Let me see. Yeah, hundred. Uh, so this was the, the initial excavation of the site was 120 years ago. Whoa. But there's only 19 of the skulls that are currently available out of the hundreds of burials that took place there i don't know where those skulls went mm. but <laughs> but the, took uh, them home. people yeah people probably took them home over the years like what do you do well we already dug them up we don't need to you know here take this ornament they all look uh, the here, same go, to me <laughs> go go use this in your hamlet play or something right uh but it's unfortunate because examining those skulls we might be able to see if this was a more widespread procedure right. in this community. There's also, this is uh, this group that was also previously looked at a different Longobard site in more Northern Italy that had found a man who had survived amputation of his hand and had a prosthetic blade attached. The blade. Showed, yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna get a hand. Uh, was, I'm, I'm gonna have a knife. I will or at shiv least you. He, at, at least <laughs> they chose to bury him with his prosthetic okay. blade, which had a strap on it that could yeah. be tightened with his is teeth. It, this is Evil Dead, then, right? That's right. What this is. He, he traveled in time, right? So there you go. And and he'd survived the amputation and the the bone wear around that that. Uh, uh, prosthetic blade had shown wear from uh, extended use. use. Yeah, so, so this things. was a community. <laughs> was that he a had... butcher? Like I need to know. Right, he's a. He's like, oh yes, uh, he must. Pre he's the best prep cook we have. We must <laughs> treat like he's a fencer. Chopping broccoli, chopping he's broccoli. Like, he's even better at fencing. But this is, I mean, oh it's another gosh. example of what seems like really kind of advanced medical uh, abilities for this, this culture of barbarians. And then the thing you think of is, well, this was also warrior culture. So they spent a lot of time fighting for, for the territories that they were taking or getting hired to take or, or what have you. So I kind of thought of this as the, tr the, the intersection between athletes and sports medicine, where athletes get all of these uh, injuries that, you know, a lot of them that normal people get too, but, but because they're really important to get them back out there, there's a whole lot of focus from the medical community on repairing the knee or the ankle or treating this or that. And so maybe they just became medical experts because people kept getting sliced up and they just had to figure out how to keep them alive long enough and get them put the prosthetic. prosthetic but, yeah, I can then on we're their still your hand back, back but I'll tell you what I can do. Right. But yeah. we're still just seeing a small number of these. And so yes. it could be that a small number of people do have great immune systems and they fight off bacterial infections and they do great and they survive. Yeah. But a lot of them just died and we're just not seeing them. 
Yes, of course. That is, there's that. Of course. Yes. Ah. Well, speaking of not wanting to die, yes. um, <laughs> uh, researchers at MIT have been working on how to model people's hearts. And so in their most recent work that they have just published in Science Robotics, which gives you an idea of what kind of a heart I'm talking about here, uh, these researchers took advantage of the, uh, the pandemic and staying at home to um, work on their modeling of synthetic hearts. They used 3D models of patients' hearts. So they scanned people's hearts, took 3D models of them, and then 3D printed these hearts so that they could then try and model the fluid dynamics and the flow of blood through the hearts. And so the, there are sleeves around various parts of the heart and the fake aorta, these synthetic printed things that are kind of like blood pressure cuffs that could be inflated and deflated to mimic the pumping of the heart. And uh, the people that they were specifically looking at it were, uh, were have been diagnosed with aortic stenosis. And norm normally aortic sten stenosis is treated by implanting a synthetic valve, widens the aorta's natural valve so that more blood can flow through. But this could be a situation where in the future, doctors 3D scan your heart, they make a 3D model of your heart and aorta, they test it to see exactly how your stenosis, your particular stenosis is influencing fluid flow, and then design a new valve for you specific to your personal problems that can then be implanted. Cool. Okay. Right? Well. Much better my than first valve. My first... <laughs> My first uh, reaction is, uh, can't you can't you digitize it? I mean, can we do that on a computer? Digitize it, sure, but it doesn't work the exact same way. So this, in this particular case, they've got a physical model that is physiologically accurate, functional. They can really test the fluid flow. Um, yes, of course, you can make the computer model and. Uh, but, but maybe you're going to get things wrong. And so until they get to that particular point, maybe these physical models are going to help them really understand how blood flows through the hearts, through the interior chambers, how it pools in some places, how it doesn't in others, um, you know, the, the individual differences in how the walls of the ventricles and the now, see, now that you've described it, I want if I was going to choose between, I would definitely want the physical model uh, to to be yeah. analyzed and not the not some computer simulation with fake blood. Like, give me the real thing. Yeah. So this is not they're not taking these three D model printed hearts and putting them into people yet, but uh, perhaps this is something that will eventually be able to develop a more accurate 3D tissue model of a heart. Uh, maybe this will develop beyond just understanding how they can fix little parts of hearts and become a real help to people who need heart transplants, who need valve replacements. Um, replace the being whole thing. Able, replace the whole thing, yeah. exactly. And also- a whole new heart. Exactly. And user specific, right? Yeah. So it's not just, oh, six foot tall white guys' hearts. It's yeah. going to be a diversity hey. of anatomies. <laughs> 100%. Yes. And also you can have, you can have a model of what your heart looks like when you're healthy. You can have a scan done of your heart when you're like 20 years old. And then when you go in when you're 50, they can compare and contrast and go, oh, oh, this looks different than it used to. <laughs> exactly. So lots of good things coming. Thank you, 3D printing. I really 
never kind of put these things together. And so it's fascinating to me that, uh, you know, researchers, engineers are starting to do these kinds of things to test valves and valve sizes and types and how could we do it better and what could we do it? 3D printing, everyone. It's the future. And my final study for the evening uh, has to do with our brains, our neurons in particular. How is it that our neurons are able to survive for basically our entire lives? We use them all the time. And they're not like, you know, skin cells where they slough off and die. They are well known for being long lived. Our neurons, the ones in our brains, the ones that stretch down our spinal cords, they live and they live and they live and they're doing all sorts of stuff. And the doing all sorts of stuff means that they're potentially copying a lot of DNA and there's a lot of places for things to go wrong and things to break. And so why don't our neurons break more often? Well, publishing this last week in Nature, researchers have been looking specifically at a particular transcription factor that has been discovered. It was discovered back in 2008. It's called NPAS4. Okay, it's special. It's a trans trans transcription factor that's really only found in neurons. They don't find it anywhere else. And so the question is, what is it doing here? And it regulates the activity of uh, genes that, in, that inhibit excitatory neurons. So you get excitatory external stimulation, your brain goes, Wee! and you have to have something that goes, shh, shh, calm down, don't be so excited, neurons. And so this NPAS4 is involved in calming things down a little bit or regulating the genes that are responsible for that. So what is it doing there? They did a bunch of experiments in mice. Thank goodness we love all these experiments in mice because it's really hard to do them in people. But they, uh, they decided to look to see what this transcription factor specifically was doing. And they determined that it is part of a complex that's made up of 21 different proteins. And they've called this whole complex a bunch of letters and numbers, NPAS4, new A4. Anyway, the complex binds to DNA where it has damage and makes sure that those damaged sites get fixed. And so when they inactivated the complex, the mice that did not have this NPAS nu A4, uh, they died sooner. They didn't live as long. Yeah, their brain, their neurons didn't do the work that needed to happen. And so their, their neuron, neurons just deteriorated and they died sooner. And so what they've determined is that in order to have these super active cells in the body that have to live for a long time, they're under a lot of stress all the time, breaking, they need to be fixed. And so there is this really novel DNA repair pathway that's involved in fixing the breaks that happen during the transcription process in our activated neurons. So this is what we've got to make sure is present in the jar containing Blair's mm -hmm. brain. Yes. Yes. When and I was going to say, here. before that, can I just drink this? Is this like something I could just... You can. Like, you can. Oh, however, oh, drill a hole. first you need the hole. Drill a hole and then inject it in. There you drill, go. Drill the hole in your brain. You should volunteer for that one, Blair. <sighs> yes. We have don't use the turtle. That is a mistake. That has nothing to do with... Uh, you use the turtle shell to drill out the... Oh, there's the terrapin. <laughs> oh, this train is stopping at Terrapin Station for a little trepanation. I might be a little trepidatious at this moment in time. <sighs> Have we made it to the end of the show? I think we did. <laughs> I think we did it. Our brain's intact. Hopefully all of our neuronal repair complexes are activated and we'll be working overtime mm -hmm. while we uh, sleep during that mm -hmm. essential period of time that we need for getting good grades. 
Gotta wear shades. <sighs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are going to be back. I hope you enjoyed the show. I have a bunch of shout outs for people. So Fada, thank you so much for all your help with social media and show descriptions and all the work that you do. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Gord, Arnlor, others who help out in the chat rooms, thank you for keeping our chat rooms nice, happy places to be. And Rachel, thank you for your wonderful assistance in editing the show, keeping us going uh, as we always need to be. And to our Patreon sponsors, I would like to say thank you so much to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Carol Tazi, Karen Tazi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Rudin, Noodles, Jack Bryan, Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean, Clarence, Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Ripon, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Randy Lewis, Paul, Rick, Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, e Eric Nappy, O, oh, Adam Mishkon, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie Paul, Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Yay. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you would like to be a Patreon sponsor, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back broadcasting live Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And again, Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while you sharpen your knife hand? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to the stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will end up on a pop quiz at an 8 a.m. biology class at a nearby college, and that means no one will ever see it. <laughs> no! However, however, answers to the pop quiz uh, can be derived by pinging us on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki and at Jackson Fly, as well as at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes through in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan.
We Woo. have come to the after show. The end of show. Big time woo. Big time woo. Oh, yeah. Paul Disney is saying I should share the haiku that he made. <laughs> ah, oh, Dolly. Dolly, too, made a picture. And uh, the haiku splattered hippo poo, messy lizard gizzard goo, call zoo cleaning crew. <laughs> there we very have it. That's very good. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing, Paul. And then there was this image that went along with it. Oh, if I can make it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dolly, too, we think. Very good. It's so fun. Kiki, How's it were going? You, were you going to show us a picture of your blizzard? Yes. Well, yes. Let's see. I have many, many blizzard pictures. It's so snowy up here. Oh, my goodness. I could hear it started raining here during the show still raining oh my god <laughs> there's snow lots of snow this is this is outdoors right before the show started okay. my backyard is covered in snow why is it pink because there's a pink a magenta light on outside okay yes i was gonna say i thought that you White were out. um that it was light out <laughs> when you took those pictures right before the show and I was like, she's north of me. How is that possible? <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> I'm confused. We do get a, a yeah. I'm, yeah, a little less daylight than you do, but yeah. I mean, this, at least the same amount is the yeah. thing. There was much snow. Lots of snow. Many snows in the views. Hello, Jan. Oh, yes. I'm going to sneeze. It's about time. <laughs> I sneezed, I coughed, I yawned. I did it all in like a five second span in the beginning of the show. <laughs> all My whole the body things. was just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> just get rid of it right now. <laughs> it looks like Minnesota. Yeah, this cold front, this storm is going right across the United States. It's so fascinating cold and snow all over the place it's supposed to possibly I even snow in la maybe what i don't know yeah it's the the weather warning i get um through my work said that it was going to snow as low as fifteen thousand, no 1500 feet um, elevation in california but in the bay area but that's you know still 1500 feet higher than i'm at so Exactly. Yeah. You're pretty much at sea level there. I'm at sea level. I actually, I would bet I'm like a couple feet below because it's, <laughs> I have to go upstairs to go to the Bay Trail for my house. So it definitely feels like there's like, it's, I might be a couple feet below sea level. I don't know. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. People like digging holes. Yeah. <laughs> we have Justin back. Hello. I missed the picture. Of the mm. snow. I missed the picture of the snow. I can put it up again. Um, oh, yep. Looks as though schools are closed tomorrow. Tomorrow Ooh. is officially a snow day here Whoa. in Portland. Nice. Yes. Kyle will be so upset. <laughs> So not. <laughs> he was like, today he got home. Yeah, look at that snow. <laughs> so I have a question because I've never lived anywhere that has snow days. A lot of workplaces don't then have snow days, right? So like, what are you supposed to do with your children if your office still wants you to come in? You call in snow day. Is that what you do? You have to use sick time? I, I, so, yeah, I, 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 this is the whole uh, diatribe I could go on. Uh, <laughs> if yeah. it, because uh, I'm learning about the system here in Denmark, 
And if you have to stay home because of your kid, it doesn't count as your sick day. What? Yeah. It's crazy, right? That sounds reasonable. It's because it's reasonable. And Mm -hmm. and that's that's what they've created here is a very reasonable society. (laughs) However, tremendous lack of snow. I must say, for a winter in Denmark, there has not been the snow that you're getting right now. Yeah. Oh my god, it's snowing snowing in San Jose. Yeah, Yeah. what? That is that is not a place for anybody who doesn't know. San Jose is not a place that is used to uh-uh. seeing snow. No, it's not in fact, called Snow Jose. It's uh-uh. not used to seeing that much rain. If you saw any Either. pictures or videos of what happened during the storm parade a few weeks ago, San Jose's infrastructure is not the best for that. For there weather. was like <laughs> there were there were cars underwater in San Jose. Really? Yes. Wow. So, oh, uh, oh, humanity! Infrastructure, come on, let's let's get some resilient infrastructure. I mean, I don't want to hear about to do that. You would have to collect yeah. taxes. Oh, <laughs> hey, you know what country has great infrastructure? We <laughs> <laughs> don't okay. want to hear any more about that. Yeah, uh, enough. Uh, enough already. Wowzers. Yeah, snowing all over the Bay Area. Very weird. Very weird. We'll see. Weird. See if any of it sticks. I want to see pictures of sledding. In Portland, we get the people who like go down the streets on their skis. They're like, yeah, ski time. Nice. Yes. I am a tired person. Blair is yawning already. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess then it's time for me to start my day. (laughs) Good night, Blair. (laughs) Good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. (gasps) Good night. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We hope you have a wonderful week. Have a great night. Enjoy snow wherever you are. Even if you don't have snow, enjoy the idea of snow. Yeah. It's, It's cold and fluffy. I like my warm and fluffy cat better. But anyway, I'm inside. You're inside. Stay warm, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious. We'll see you next week.